Thank you, Mignon and Joyce and Dr. Federley. I'd like to share with you these words as I light the chalice flame. A flame casts light that illuminates darkness. So may we, through the acts of understanding, penetrate into the unknown and unseen. May we follow the guide of the light of understanding and seek to see what is hidden for the sake of our common humanity and to bring reconciliation to all our relationships. Today I will be talking about my experience of race and becoming, I hope, more aware of its power and influence as an issue, a social issue. And I'd like to share with you as opening words some remarks made by uh, a black writer and a Native American writer that help us to see from the perspective of people who are outside of the majority group in our society. The first reading is from John A. Powell and is entitled The Invisibility of Whiteness. The invisibility of whiteness means that one doesn't have to notice that one is white. So there are people and then there are black people. There are people and there are Latino people and people, just people, just folks, turn out to be white. But we don't notice it. White people don't have to think about race. That is the benefit of being white, of being part of the dominant group. Just like men don't have to think about gender. The system works for you and you don't have to think about it. So they live in this social world unique to them and then they don't have to think about it. First, they think about race as something that belongs to someone else. The blacks have race. Maybe Latinos have race. Maybe Asians have race, but they're just white. They're just people. That's part of being white. The second reading is from a Native American writer who uh, is anonymous, who, who wrote, Sometimes, when it's just the stars and the moon and my thoughts, I wish I could place your hand upon my beating heart so you can feel this unforgiving generational trauma that haunts my soul. I am not soliciting sympathy. I simply want you to understand the red road I travel. Thank you, Pam. That was a very powerful story and very powerful lesson you taught with it. And it resonated with many things I have experienced. The following stories are drawn from my life and they represent points along a journey during which slowly, very slowly, I became aware of racism, its power, its omnipresence, and its invisibility to those not affected by it. I do not claim that I have arrived at a point that is racism free. I own my limitedness, imperfection, and fallibility. Yet I hope that over the years I have gained an awareness of the power and the corrosive force of racism. 
I believe that the following stories illustrate how easy it is to absorb racism, how it affects everyone, including those who believe that they are free of all traces of racism. I was born on the western edge of Birmingham, Alabama, very close to the line of the city of Fairfield. My social life, my family social life, transpired within the orbit of Fairfield. The daily life of my family and everyone I knew was segregated. Racism was the unquestioned assumption that was always in the background, sometimes in the foreground. It did not need to be explained or justified. It was what it was. When I was 10 years old, during the early days of summer, I was incredibly excited because I was about to be able to walk on my own the mile and a half from our home to a public swimming pool. This public swimming pool was the place my sisters and brothers had swam for years, and I, being too young to join them, had watched them with great envy looking outside the iron gate. On this day, I walked proudly the mile and a half to the pool, and on my arrival, I was shocked to learn that the water had been taken out of the pool, and the pool had been filled with sand beyond the brim. Someone nearby, a stranger, told me, yeah, this is the way we're going to keep the blacks out of this pool. I was upset that I missed out on swimming. I walked a mile and a half back to my home, despondent. Never did it enter my mind for a second to think about the immense hatred required to do an act, an illegal act like this by certain people. Summer passes to fall. There's a bombing at a church about 10 miles from my home. Four young girls are killed. Years later, when I was working in Birmingham, about five years ago, I had lunch with one of the young women who was nearby when this blast occurred. She is a survivor of it, and this event haunts her terribly, even unto the present. I knew men who were surely like the men, I thought, who did this deed. I knew people who had so much hatred they were capable of doing something like this. And at that early age of 10, I had a visceral sense that there's right and wrong, good and evil, and I wanted to be on the side of good. But it did not really enter my mind that there was something omnipresent like racism that made such deeds possible. My family was a study in contrasts. My father was progressive and liberal in his views about race and politics, but he never talked about it publicly outside the home. My mother, however, expressed racist views and opinions. I loved both of my parents and respected them, but I strongly favored the views of my father. Extensive and lively debates occurred within our home, but not outside the home. The story of race in my life growing up would be incomplete without mentioning Maddie. Her role in our family life illustrates the ambiguity of race in the South. Maddie was a black woman who did domestic work in our home three days a week. She also worked for my mother's catering service. 
For over 10 years, at least, we were the main source of her income. She worked with and for our family for at least 25 years. Maddie was married at 14 and had 10 children. Her husband worked at U.S. Steel and was the minister at the church across the street from their house. Each of their 10 children completed and finished college. Maddie was also, as best as I could tell, one of my mother's most intimate and best friends. Maddie exuded confidence, optimism, and a can-do attitude. She was a confidant and companion to me. At age 16, I was assigned the job of driving Maddie from our home to her home and from various work jobs to her home. I did this for several years. And as I did this, I began to notice certain things about the neighborhood Maddie lived in. The homes in Maddie's neighborhood were probably at least half the size of white people's homes. The pieces of property the homes set on were about half the size. There were no alleys, no sidewalks, and the streets were more narrow, and nobody, it appeared, had a garage so that everybody's car had to be parked on the street, which meant that the roads themselves in the black neighborhood were very difficult to navigate. I saw this as the way of the world, and I knew the reason why they were living in cramped quarters. It was because they were black. I was very unconscious, even then, of racism as a force. When I was a sophomore in high school, our school was suddenly integrated. White children fled to private schools. I fled to a nearby public school in Inslee. My history teacher was a black man who wore a suit and a tie to work each day. He exuded a great dignity. He never used notes to speak. He loved history. He loved teaching history. I developed a great admiration for his dignity. As years passed, I marvel at his self-possession, his sense of dignity, his dedication, and his love of his own life and his affirmation of his own life and what he did amid this sea of racism in which he lived. After a year, I returned to Fairfield High School. There was tension in the air continually. The school I returned to was 65% black. The principal of the school, who was white, lived a block from my parents' home, and he talked my parents into bringing me back to Fairfield. In the fall of my junior year, I was, among other things, on the basketball team. I know that's an absurdity, but the white coach was recruiting everybody he could to balance his team with white and black players. In the fall of my junior year, we went to Hueytown, Alabama. It was probably the very first time black people, for our team was mostly black, had played against a white team in a totally segregated town. Tension filled the air. Midway in the first quarter, a fight broke out and soon both stands on either side of the court emptied onto the floor of the court and an immense brawl broke out. Our coach instructed us, yelled at us to quickly leave and get into the bus outside the building. We did so. Outside, a bus was waiting for us 
as we clambered inside the bus and closed the door, a gang of white youths, teenagers, came rushing up upon the bus and started cursing and yelling and banging their fists against the wall of the bus and against the pane of the bus. And I was terrified looking out. And although the hatred of those young men was cast towards the black persons in the bus, I sensed and I felt and I saw their twisted faces and their raw hatred. And I wondered what on earth could create such depth of hate. Years later, I am a UU minister serving a congregation in Florida. I'm attending a training event on conflict resolution. It's being led by a couple, a white clergy couple, who were Presbyterian ministers and who had worked with Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu, in South Africa dealing with conflict resolution. They had come to this particular facility and to which leaders from all over the community had been invited to teach conflict resolution. At least 35% were black leaders. We were broken into small groups. We were advised to talk about our relationship to the subject of race, our experience of race, and so forth. And when it came my time to talk in this group of eight, I decided to talk about my experience with Maddie. And as I spoke, I noticed that a young black man on the opposite side of my circle began to look tense. And so I tried to increase the emotion of what I said and to emphasize the closeness I had with Maddie. And in spite of my attempts to sort of warm toward him by doing so, I noticed that he continued to be agitated, indeed more so. After I had finished speaking, everyone was invited to speak. And the young black man, about my age at the time, was the first to talk. And what he said was this, my mother did what your Maddie did. Let me explain to you what that was like. When she came home at night, she had nothing left emotionally for us, her children, after being nice to you all day. She brought home her anger after listening all day to your white people bullshit. And she was burdened down more than you know by all the petty insults that she heard from you when you didn't even know you were insulting her or my people. Yet she suffered through it. And that tiny salary you gave her, which barely kept us alive, made her keep coming back. It took a lot of suffering from my people to keep you white people happy. Are you self-satisfied now? And he went on like this for some time, more powerfully than I can explain, more passionately than I can convey. And I felt like if he had had the chance, he would kill me. His emotion was so intense. After this, it began to dawn on me that everything I had thought about race was horribly inadequate and that I had used a system and benefited by a system that disadvantaged others as it advantaged others like me. 
Years later, I was living and working in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I got to know three families very, very well who were persons of color. And during the course of the police shootings of black people that made national news that occurred at the time, I was able to listen to the concerns and fears of this group of three families separately and collectively. And what they said was a revelation to me because I knew them well and they shared with me an unfiltered view of their true thoughts. And they had to a person as parents a deep, powerful, overwhelming fear about the well-being and welfare of their children, particularly the male children. They exuded a raw terror of the arbitrary power white policemen had over them in certain circumstances and the willingness of that force to be used against them in a brutal and deadly way. Again, the feeling came upon me, I have never known such terror as these persons experience on a daily basis. Finally, let me share with you a concluding experience that is most recent. For the last four years, I have watched white politicians affiliated with the political power, uh, political party currently in power, being comfortable with abandoning democracy and embracing fascism and authoritarianism if it meant being able to avoid having to accept and live collaboratively with people of other races. And at the core of their belief, I believe, is the inability to embrace diversity and a commitment to cling to the ideology of white supremacy no matter what. This led in our country to what former National Security Advisor Susan Rice called the near-death experience of democracy in America, that the power and allure of white supremacy would sway many educated people in positions of power to forsake democracy, I found terrifying. But then I suspect that what I felt so fleetingly was something black people have known for generations. All of these experiences I have shared, and many more I could share like it, led me to become convinced that white people do not understand the degree to which racism permeates the belief systems and the assumptions and the institutions of our common life, nor the degree to which the social, political, educational, medical, psychological, and physical lives of millions of people are affected daily by racism. When you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Progress has been made, but it is slow, and it is susceptible to regression. This week in Georgia, Doug Collins, a man campaigning for someone running for senator in Georgia, said the following about Reverend Warnack, a black man running for senator in Georgia. I quote, There is no such thing as a pro-choice pastor. When you, what you have is a lie from the bed of hell. It is time to send it back to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Unquote. Ebenezer Baptist Church is the home church of Reverend King. It is where Reverend Warnock currently serves as minister. What was Doug Collins, 
who is a chaplain in the U.S. Air Force Reserve with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and a U.S. Representative for Georgia's 9th Congressional District, referring to when he said, send it back to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Was he referring to Reverend Warnock as it? Racism still thrives in our country. I think racism and understanding racism gets to the heart of what it means to live our faith and practice the worth and dignity of all persons by trying to comprehend the force and power of racism. I do not often know what to say about race fearful that I might offend someone by what I say or say something that is incorrect or wrong or flawed in some deep way and therefore most of the time I keep quiet. I am also uncomfortable with white people who hammer away at others about racism. And I am aware that anti-racism works has sometimes, by whites, been weaponized against other whites. I think black people are the best authorities on racism. I think to be fully human, all white people must understand the depth and power of racism. I don't always know how to express that. My posture is to listen and learn about my privilege as these brief series of stories have illuminated that often is a path going from unconsciousness to more conscious that is very arduous for the people so involved. I am encouraging each of you, if you are willing and able, to watch the film which will play after this service. It conveys so powerfully and simply what I would want to say about the nature of racism. And it gets, I believe, to the heart of what practicing our faith means. As I extinguish our chalice flame, I share with you these words of benediction from Reverend Rebecca Parker. There is a love at work in the world. There is a love holding us. There is a love holding us all of us. May we rest in this love. Amen.